So this little gadget, this may very well change the way we pull Espresso forever. Take almost everything you know about shot dialing theory and throw it out the window because this changes the rules completely. So for over 75 years since Achilles Gaja introduced his spring lever espresso machine, we've had this thing called dial-in. Essentially dialing in here is defined as the process of pulling multiple shots with different grinder settings to achieve a specific shot weight within a specific time frame. Grind too coarse and the flow is too fast leading to sour under extracted espresso. Too fine and you get a bitter, dense, molasses-like shot. See, the main issue with traditional extraction is that to a very first approximation, it follows the equivalent of Ohm's law, but for fluid dynamics. Here, pressure and flow rate are coupled via the puck's water resistance, which to a large extent is a fixed time-dependent function. Pressure and flow rate are not independent variables during the shot, but ideally we'd want them to be, because then we could set a flow rate for some chosen pressure, say 9 bars, and irrespective of the small changes to the grind size, we would get a desired shot weight of liquid within some time frame. But the only way to make pressure and flow rate independent variables is to manipulate puck resistance during extraction. Now, there's probably a couple of ways of doing this, but the J-Lever does so using this, a back pressure plate. It replaces a puck screen and sits on top of the puck. And what it does is it adds an extra compressive back pressure force to the back of the puck, up to about 100 kilograms worth of force. Now, to understand what this is doing to extraction, we need some espresso theory, but I have to stress here, this is just my theory slash opinion. This theory seems to explain a lot of espresso related phenomena. I'm confident it's correct, but it does need to be confirmed and validated by coffee researchers. But with that said, let's start by asking a very basic question. What's the main fundamental physical process that creates that delicious, characteristic, effervescent, bright, kind of fruity, infinitely complex espresso taste that's so distinctive from an immersive brew? And also, why does an espresso recipe play such a prominent role in producing good traditional espresso? Let's drill down a little deeper. By recipe, what we're actually seeking is just a desired set liquid weight over some time frame for some chosen dose and chosen ratio. And ratio is really just a strength or a dilution, so we don't have to worry about it for now. However, a set amount of liquid weight over a specific time, well, that's just the very definition of a flow rate. So we're really chasing a flow rate, but why is flow rate so important? Going back to a version of Ohm's law for puck fluid dynamics, since our pressure, puck thickness, basket diameter, coffee bean density are all largely fixed, what we're really doing when we're seeking a desired flow rate is we're really seeking the following. A very specific ensemble average of the total sum of cross-sectional areas of the bypassed aperture channels around any one particular coffee grind. For simplicity, let's represent this sum as a single aperture diameter. And let's put it to the side of the coffee grind to represent it graphically. But it should be clear this single aperture represents the sum of all water bypass channels around the coffee grind for any one particular coffee grind within the puck. So now the question becomes, why are we seeking a specific bypassed aperture diameter? What physical process is controlled by this aperture? And it turns out the critical but somewhat obvious answer is that by constricting the aperture, what we're really doing is forcing a pressure differential across the grind's upper and lower face. So water really has nowhere to go except through the internal molecular structure of the grind particle, as opposed to around the grind particle. And this process forces the evacuation of dissolvable solids from inside the grind more effectively than just an immersion brew, which relies on the physics of diffusion. So in summary, the hypothesis here is that creating good pressure differential across the grind is the key fundamental physical process that's required for excellent espresso extraction. And we can write that criteria as follows. We seek a specific bypass diameter and it has to be within a maximum and a minimum diameter. 
Now those special brackets that you see, that's just an ensemble average. It's just a fancy way of saying an average across all particles within the puck. Now this diameter is not some universal number, it has many functional dependencies. However, if it's too large for a specific shot in question, then more water is allowed to bypass around the grind, which actually erodes the molecular structure of the side of the particle. And bypassing the water also fails to properly liberate the dissolvable solids from within the particle. If the aperture diameter is too small, then the bottom layer acts as an ultra-fine filter and filters out these kind of suspended colloid coffee particles that contribute to body and complexity. That's why people find filter paper shots a little less complex and a little more filtered, but it's not the filter paper that's doing the filtering because it's too coarse. It's actually the fact that the filter paper is causing you to grind finer, and then that creates this kind of fine, ultra-fine filter layer. Secondly, if these apertures are too small, then we run the risk of a macroscopic issue, namely air locking. And I won't bore you with the physics of surface tensions and why air locking happens. Instead, I'll just link it below for the academically minded. But I believe this model explains a lot. For example, it, it really explains clearly why pressurized portafilter baskets don't really reproduce this fundamental extraction process. And they're just kind of pressurized immersion brewing. It also explains the antagonism that we commonly see between espresso body and espresso brightness and tasting notes. Namely, we can either have more body by using a larger bypass diameter, which is so typical of smaller diameter baskets, or we can have more tasting notes by using a smaller bypass diameter. But we struggle to max out both. It also explains why almost any basket diameter or hole size or hole pattern can produce excellent espresso as long as the previously mentioned criteria is satisfied. And of course it explains why air locking happens and why we can't just grind smaller and smaller for higher extraction. Lastly, it also explains why espresso shots time out. These diameters really just open up in later stages of the shot and you really just want to stop the shot at that point because you're just eroding more of the size structure of the coffee particles. But now that we understand this model, let's apply it to traditional extraction. Here we can define three distinct functional layers. The most critically important layer in its function and action is actually the top layer, as this layer provides the lower layers with a compressive back pressure force. And it's actually this back pressure force that controls and limits aperture diameters. The complication for traditional espresso is that the back pressure compressive force is largely functionally dependent on the puck depth. And in fact, at the very top of the puck, the coffee grinds are actually experiencing the zero downward force. So we can hypothesize in traditional espresso, even in the best shot you can ever hope to pull, some layers are actually being extracted with edge erosion, and you can't help that. We can only hope to minimize it, while the top layer has very little compressive back pressure force to speak of, and is actually extracted in an immersive brewing regime, albeit at nine bar. Now, as mentioned, this picture changes with time. So traditional espresso is actually metastable. It's a cat and mouse game of strict timings and mixings of different extraction types and the balancing thereof, where we try to maximize the ideal extraction layer thickness and minimize immersion brewing extraction layers. Of course, as our shot progresses, we move more and more into the immersive region because our back pressure is constantly degrading. Degrading back pressure is what makes traditional espresso so difficult, even for the brister, let alone people in a domestic setting. And it's why we see companies create all these complex monitoring systems for charting things to control this process. But what if we added an artificial compressive back pressure using a perforated piston that doesn't degrade? How does that change the picture? Benefit here is really twofold. Firstly, our goal is to move the extraction into the ideal region for longer to force a good pressure differential across the grinds. But secondly, the major benefit is that we can manipulate the puck's average ensemble aperture diameter on the fly to get a near constant espresso flow rate. The downside is that we have to be careful we don't excessively constrict the apertures in the bottom layer so that this layer filters out the colloids which add flavor and create an espresso that's a little lacking on body. Now in the previous video, I also said that this thing instantaneously adjusts puck resistance on the fly without any electronics. It took me a while to figure out what was actually happening. You see, the amount of back pressure this plate will put on the puck depends on the pressure differential between the upper and lower chambers. If we grind too coarse and the puck erodes too fast in the lower chamber, hydrostatic water pressure in the lower chamber drops because the water is flowing too fast then there's a larger pressure differential and the plate puts an even greater force on the puck 
and slows the flow. Conversely, if we grind too fine, the plate doesn't add much back pressure because there might be nine bar on here, but there's probably eight bar within the puck. And so there's this neat feedback effect where the system is constantly adjusting itself and you never really get any kind of end state channeling. In this system, the back pressure that's applied actually scales with time, which is what you want. But the really exciting part is that there are improvements that we can make to this existing prototype, such as a constant flow valve, an integrated non-return, and or other fancy pressure versus flow functional forms, instead of just a hole constricting the flow. And of course, this technology can be integrated into expressor machines, not necessarily using water pressure to create the force, but a perforated piston and a force actuator, where it's gonna save a lot of wasted coffee because the machine will be able to adjust puck resistance to retain a set expresso flow profile for a set pressure profile, even if the grind size drifts with burr temperatures or hopper height pressure or humidity, or the customer in a cafe asks for a specific dose, or, or they might want a light roast or a dark roast that you can extract on the same machine and the brister doesn't need to redial each time. So that's really exciting. So now let's reconfigure the camera and let's demo this thing. We'll pull two shots, one with the grind way too coarse and the other with a back pressure plate and we'll see how it fixes it. So I've ground about 40 grams on the Bratza at a grind setting very close to what you get from a typical supermarket pre-ground. Way too coarse for a 58 mil Pullman basket, which we've got installed on the J-Lever. Some WD with a new WDT tool. About five seconds is all I'll ask of people. Level tamp by watching the spirit level. Non-constricting perforated retainer plate goes in. And I pull a shot here at about one bar. It's just flooding through, no crema. Shot's way too fast as expected. Clearly way too coarse. Resetting the machine. Note the crema disappear. Again, 20 grams in using exactly the same grind. Forgot the back pressure plate. Using a back pressure plate with a 0.4 mil constriction. The back pressure plates do range from about 0.3 to 0.5. Starting the shot and what comes out quite easily at the start, so I slam the puck with pressure. But a little too hard at the start, I should have backed off when I noticed the puck jam up. But I was paying attention to the camera and the wobbly table. And the shot went for about 45 seconds, which is just a tad over. But lots of crema, which shouldn't be there by any application of traditional espresso theory. So the back pressure plate recovered the shot completely. Good crema and an excellent extraction. Even though the grind was way too coarse. So that's it. So this back pressure plate is the last component that will be sold with the J lever on the Kickstarter. And it'll just make it so much easier for people that don't know anything about espresso to take some freshly ground beans without worrying about the grind size and still pull good espresso. And it'll give enthusiasts a new thing to explore because it does produce an interesting new shot. Now this particular version only works with a bottom to up flow espresso maker because I've made no attempt at an internal distribution of water. Gravity does that for an, a bottom to up flow espresso maker. However, on the Kickstarter, we will have kits where 
we will have plates inside that will distribute the water. And the kit will include the pressure plate and I think the new basket and this little tool, extractor tool because it really does come in handy. So that's it. Auto adjusting, no dial in class espresso machines. That's what's coming to the world of espresso, a new frontier. If you like these innovations and you want to see them on Kickstarter, please share this video with your friends and subscribe. Future videos won't be so boring, I promise. They'll mostly just be shorts showing how the whole J Lever system works. I hope to see you there.